Chapter Thirty Three Blissful. All this time I had gone on loving Dora harder than ever. Her idea was my refuge in disappointment and distress, and made some amends to me even for the loss of my friend. The more I pitied myself or pitied others, the more I sought for consolation in the image of Dora. The greater the accumulation of deceit and trouble in the world, the brighter and the purer shone the star of Dora high above the world. I don't think I had any definite idea where Dora came from, or in what degree she was related to a higher order of beings, but I am quite sure I should have scouted the notion of her being simply human, like any other young lady, with indignation and contempt. If I may so express it, I was steeped in Dora. I was not merely over head and ears in love with Dora, but I was saturated through and through. Enough love might have been wrung out of me, metaphorically speaking, to drown anybody in, and yet there would have remained enough within me, and all over me, to pervade my entire existence. The first thing I did on my own account when I came back was to take a night walk to Norwood, and, like the subject of a venerable riddle of my childhood, to go round and round the house, without ever touching the house, thinking about Dora. I believe the theme of this incomprehensible conundrum was the moon. No matter what it was, I, the moon-struck slave of Dora, perambulated round and round the house and garden for two hours, looking through crevices in the palings, getting my chin by dint of violent exertion above the rusty nails on the top, blowing kisses at the lights in the windows, and romantically calling on the night at intervals to shield my Dora, I don't know exactly what from, I suppose from fire, perhaps from mice to which she had a great objection. My love was so much in my mind, and it was so natural to me to confide in Peggotty, when I found her again by my side of an evening with the old set of industrial implements, busily making the tour of my wardrobe, that I imparted to her, in a sufficiently roundabout way, my great secret. Peggotty was strongly interested, but I could not get her into my view of the case at all. She was audaciously prejudiced in my favour, and quite unable to understand why I should have any misgivings, or be low-spirited about it. The young lady might think herself well off, she observed, to have such a bow. And as to her pa, she said, what did the gentleman expect, for gracious sake? I observed, however, that Mr. Spenlow's proctorial gown and stiff cravat took Peggotty down a little, and inspired her with a greater reverence for the man who was gradually becoming more and more etherealized in my eyes every day, and about whom a reflected radiance seemed to me to beam when he sat erect in court among his papers, like a little lighthouse in a sea of stationery. And by the by, it used to be uncommonly strange to me to consider, I remember, as I sat in court too, how those dim old judges and doctors wouldn't have cared for Dora if they had known her, how they wouldn't have gone out of their senses with rapture if marriage with Dora had been proposed to them, how Dora might have sung and played upon that glorified guitar until she led me to the verge of madness, yet not have tempted one of those slow-goers an inch out of his road. I despise them to a man. Frozen out old gardeners in the flower-beds of the heart, I took a personal offence against them all. The bench was nothing to me but an insensible blunderer. The bar had no more tenderness or poetry in it than the bar of a public-house. Taking the management of Peggotty's affairs into my own hands, with no little pride, I proved the will, and came to a settlement with the legacy duty office, and took her to the bank, and soon got everything into an orderly train. We varied the legal character of these proceedings by going to see some perspiring waxwork in Fleet Street, melted, I should hope, these twenty years, and by visiting Miss Linwood's exhibition, which I remember as a mausoleum of needlework, favourable to self-examination and repentance, and by inspecting the Tower of London, and going to the top of St. Paul's. All these wonders afforded Peggotty as much pleasure as she was able to enjoy, under existing circumstances, except, I think, St. Paul's, which, from her long attachment to her work-box, became a rival of the picture on the lid, and was, in some particulars, vanquished, she considered, by that work of art. Peggotty's business, which was what we used to call common-form business in the commons, and very light and lucrative the common-form business was, being settled, I took her down to the office one morning to pay her bill. Mr. Spenlow had stepped out, old Tiffy said, to get a gentleman sworn for a marriage licence, but as I knew he would be back directly, our place lying close to the surrogates and to the vicar-general's office too, I told Peggotty to wait. 
We were a little like undertakers in the commons, as regarded probate transactions, generally making it a rule to look more or less cut up when we had to deal with clients in mourning. In a similar feeling of delicacy we were always blithe and light-hearted with the licensed clients. Therefore I hinted to Peggotty that she would find Mr. Spenlow much recovered from the shock of Mr. Barkis's decease, and indeed he came in like a bridegroom. But neither Peggotty nor I had eyes for him when we saw, in company with him, Mr. Murdstone. He was very little changed. His hair looked as thick and was certainly as black as ever, and his glance was as little to be trusted as of old. "'Ah, Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow, "'you know this gentleman, I believe?' I made my gentleman a distant bow, and Peggotty barely recognised him. He was at first somewhat disconcerted to meet us two together, but quickly decided what to do, and came up to me. "'I hope,' he said, "'that you are doing well.' "'It can hardly be interesting to you,' said I. "'Yes, if you wish to know.' We looked at each other, and he addressed himself to Peggotty. "'And you,' he said, "'I am sorry to observe that you have lost your husband.' "'It's not the first loss I have had in my life, Mr. Murdstone,' replied Peggotty, trembling from head to foot. "'I am glad to hope that there is nobody to blame for this one, nobody to answer for it.' "'Ah,' said he, "'that's a comfortable reflection. You have done your duty.' "'I have not worn anybody's life away,' said Peggotty. "'I am thankful to think. No, Mr. Murdstone, I have not worried and frightened any sweet creature to an early grave.' He eyed her gloomily, remorsefully, I thought, for an instant, and said, turning his head towards me, but looking at my feet instead of my face, "'We are not likely to encounter soon again. A source of satisfaction to us both, no doubt, for such meetings as this can never be agreeable. I do not expect that you, who always rebelled against my just authority, exerted for your benefit and reformation, should owe me any good will now. There is an antipathy between us.' "'An old one, I believe,' said I, interrupting him. He smiled, and shot as evil a glance at me as could come from his dark eyes. "'It rankled in your baby breast,' he said. "'It embittered the life of your poor mother. You are right. I hope you may do better yet. I hope you may correct yourself.' Here he ended the dialogue, which had been carried on in a low voice in a corner of the outer office, by passing into Mr. Spenlow's room, and saying aloud in his smoothest manner, "'Gentlemen of Mr. Spenlow's profession are accustomed to family differences, and know how complicated and difficult they always are.' With that he paid the money for his licence, and, receiving it neatly folded from Mr. Spenlow, together with a shake of his hand, and a polite wish for his happiness and the ladies, went out of the office. I might have had more difficulty in constraining myself to be silent under his words, if I had had less difficulty in impressing upon Peggotty, who was only angry on my account, good creature, that we were not in a place for recrimination, and that I besought her to hold her peace. She was so unusually roused that I was glad to compound for an affectionate hug, elicited by this revival in her mind of her old injuries, and to make the best I could of it before Mr. Spenlow and the clerks. Mr. Spenlow did not appear to know what the connection between Mr. Murdstone and myself was, which I was glad of, for I could not bear to acknowledge him, even in my own breast, remembering what I did of the history of my poor mother. Mr. Spenlow seemed to think, if he thought anything about the matter, that my aunt was the leader of the state party in our family, and that there was a rebel party commanded by someone else. So I gathered at last from what he said, while we were waiting for Mr. Tiffy to make out Peggotty's bill of costs. "'Miss Trotwood,' he remarked, "'is very firm, no doubt, and not likely to give way to opposition. I have an admiration for her character, and I may congratulate you, Copperfield, on being on the right side. Differences between relations are much to be deplored, but they are extremely general, and the great thing is to be on the right side, meaning, I take it, on the side of the moneyed interest.' "'Rather a good marriage, this, I believe,' said Mr. Spenlow. I explained that I knew nothing about it. "'Indeed.' he said, speaking from the few words Mr. Murdstone dropped, as a man frequently does on these occasions, and from what Miss Murdstone let fall, I should say it was rather a good marriage. "'Do you mean that there is money, sir?' I asked. "'Yes,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'I understand there's money. Beauty, too, I am told.' "'Indeed. Is his new wife young?' "'Just of age,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'So lately that I should think they have been waiting for that.' "'Lord deliver her!' said Peggotty, so very emphatically and unexpectedly, that we were all three discomposed, until Tiffy came in with the bill. 
Old Tiffy soon appeared, however, and handed it to Mr. Spenlow to look over. Mr. Spenlow, settling his chin in his cravat and rubbing it softly, went over the items with a deprecatory air, as if it were all Jorkins's doing, and handed it back to Tiffy with a bland sigh. "'Yes,' he said, "'that's right, quite right. I should have been extremely happy, Copperfield, to have limited these charges to the actual expenditure out of pocket, but it is an irksome incident in my professional life that I am not at liberty to consult my own wishes. I have a partner, Mr. Jorkins.' As he said this with a gentle melancholy, which was the next thing to making no charge at all, I expressed my acknowledgments on Peggotty's behalf, and paid Tiffy in banknotes. Peggotty then retired to her lodgings, and Mr. Spenlow and I went into court, where we had a divorce suit coming on, under an ingenious little statute, repealed now, I believe, but in virtue of which I have seen several marriages annulled, of which the merits were these. The husband, whose name was Thomas Benjamin, had taken out his marriage license as Thomas only, suppressing the Benjamin in case he should not find himself as comfortable as he expected. Not finding himself as comfortable as he expected, or being a little fatigued with his wife, poor fellow, he now came forward by a friend, after being married a year or two, and declared that his name was Thomas Benjamin, and therefore he was not married at all, which the court confirmed to his great satisfaction. I must say that I had my doubts about the strict justice of this, and was not even frightened out of them by the bushel of wheat which reconciles all anomalies. But Mr. Spenlow argued the matter with me. He said, Look at the world. There was good and evil in that. Look at the ecclesiastical law. There was good and evil in that. It was all part of a system. Very good. There you were. I had not the hardihood to suggest to Dora's father that possibly we might even improve the world a little if we got up early in the morning and took off our coats to the work, but I confessed that I thought we might improve the commons. Mr. Spenlow replied that he would particularly advise me to dismiss that idea from my mind as not being worthy of my gentlemanly character, but that he would be glad to hear from me of what improvement I thought the commons susceptible. Taking that part of the commons which happened to be nearest to us, for our man was unmarried by this time and we were out of court, and strolling past the prerogative office, I submitted that I thought the prerogative office rather a queerly managed institution. Mr. Spenlow inquired in what respect. I replied, with all due deference to his experience, but with more deference, I am afraid, to his being Dora's father, that perhaps it was a little nonsensical that the registry of that court, containing the original wills of all persons leaving effects within the immense province of Canterbury for three whole centuries, should be an accidental building, never designed for the purpose, leased by the registrars for their own private emolument, unsafe, not even ascertained to be fireproof, choked with the important documents it held, and positively from the roof to the basement, a mercenary speculation of the registrars, who took great fees from the public, and crammed the public's wills away anyhow and anywhere, having no other object than to get rid of them cheaply, that perhaps it was a little unreasonable that these registrars, in the receipt of profits amounting to eight or nine thousand pounds a year, to say nothing of the profits of the deputy registrars and clerks of seats, should not be obliged to spend a little of that money in finding a reasonably safe place for the important documents, which all classes of people were compelled to hand over to them, whether they would or no that perhaps it was a little unjust that all the great offices in this great office should be magnificent sinecures while the unfortunate working clerks in the old dark room upstairs were the worst rewarded and the least considered men doing important services in london that perhaps it was a little indecent that the principal registrar of all, whose duty it was to find the public, constantly resorting to this place, all needful accommodation, should be an enormous sinecurist in virtue of that post, and might be, besides, a clergyman, a pluralist, a holder of a staff in a cathedral, and what not, while the public was put to the inconvenience of which we have a specimen every afternoon when the office was busy, and which we knew to be quite monstrous, that perhaps, in short, this prerogative office of the Diocese of Canterbury was altogether such a pestilent job, and such a pernicious absurdity, that but for its being squeezed away in a corner of St. Paul's churchyard, which few people knew, it must have been turned completely inside out and upside down long ago. Mr. Spenlow smiled as I became modestly warm on the subject, and then argued this question with me as he had argued the other. He said, what was it, after all? It was a question of feeling. If the public felt that their wills were in safe keeping, and took it for granted that the office was not to be made better, who was the worse for it? Nobody. Who was the better for it? All the sinecurists. Very well. 
then the good predominated it might not be a perfect system nothing was perfect but what he objected to was the insertion of the wedge under the prerogative office the country had been glorious insert the wedge into the prerogative office and the country would cease to be glorious he considered it the principle of a gentleman to take things as he found them and he had no doubt the prerogative office would last our time i defer to his opinion though i had great doubts of it myself i find he was right however for it has not only lasted to the present moment but has done so in the teeth of a great parliamentary report made not too willingly eighteen years ago when all these objections of mine were set forth in detail and when the existing storage for wills was described as equal to the accumulation of only two and a half years more what they have done with them since whether they have lost money or whether they sell any now and then to the butter shops i don't know i am glad mine is not there and i hope it may not go there yet a while i have set all this down in my present blissful chapter because here it comes into its natural place mr spenlow and i falling into this conversation prolonged it and our saunter to and fro until we diverged into general topics and so it came about in the end that mr spenlow told me that this day week was dora's birthday and he would be glad if i would come down and join a little picnic on the occasion i went out of my senses immediately became a mere driveller next day on receipt of a little lace-edged sheet of note-paper favoured by papa to remind and passed the intervening period in a state of dotage i think i committed every possible absurdity in the way of preparation for this blessed event i turn hot when i remember the cravat i bought my boots might be placed in any collection of instruments of torture i provided and sent down by the norwood coach the night before a delicate little hamper amounting in itself i thought almost to a declaration there were crackers in it with the tenderest mottoes that could be got for money at six in the morning i was in covent garden market buying a bouquet for dora at ten i was on horseback i hired a gallant grey for the occasion with a bouquet in my hat to keep it fresh trotting down to norwood i suppose that when i saw dora in the garden and pretended not to see her and rode past the house pretending to be anxiously looking for it i committed two small fooleries which other young gentlemen in my circumstances might have committed because they came so very natural to me but oh when i did find the house and did dismount at the garden gate and drag those stony-hearted boots across the lawn to dora sitting on a garden seat under a lilac tree what a spectacle she was upon that beautiful morning among the butterflies with a white chip bonnet and a dress of celestial blue there was a young lady with her comparatively stricken in years almost twenty i should say her name was miss mills and dora called her julia she was the bosom friend of dora the happy miss mills jip was there and jip would bark at me again when i presented my bouquet he gnashed his teeth with jealousy well he might if he had the least idea how i adored his mistress well he might oh thank you mr copperfield what dear flowers said dora i had had an intention of saying and had been studying the best form of words for three miles that i thought them beautiful before i saw them so near her but i couldn't manage it she was too bewildering to see her lay the flowers against her little dimpled chin was to lose all presence of mind and power of language in a feeble ecstasy i wonder i didn't say kill me if you have a heart miss mills let me die here then dora held my flowers to jip to smell then jip growled and wouldn't smell them then dora laughed and held them a little closer to jip to make him then jip laid hold of a bit of geranium with his teeth and worried imaginary cats in it then dora beat him and pouted and said my poor beautiful flowers as compassionately i thought as if jip had laid hold of me i wished he had you'll be glad to hear mr copperfield said dora that that cross miss murdstone is not here she has gone to her brother's marriage and will be away at least three weeks isn't that delightful i said i was sure it must be delightful to her and all that was delightful to her was delightful to me miss mills with an air of superior wisdom and benevolence smiled upon us she's the most disagreeable thing i ever saw said dora you can't believe how ill-tempered and shocking she is julia yes i can my dear said julia you can perhaps love returned dora with her hand on julia's forgive my not accepting you my dear at first i learned from this that miss mills had had her trials in the course of a chequered existence and that to these perhaps i might refer that wise benignity of manner which i had already noticed 
I found in the course of the day that this was the case, Miss Mills having been unhappy in a misplaced affection, and being understood to have retired from the world on her awful stock of experience, but still to take a calm interest in the unblighted hopes and loves of youth. But now Mr. Spenlow came out of the house, and Dora went to him, saying, "'Look, papa, what beautiful flowers!' And Miss Mills smiled thoughtfully, as who should say, Ye mayflies, enjoy your brief existence in the bright morning of life. And we all walked from the lawn towards the carriage which was getting ready. I shall never have such a ride again. I have never had such another. There were only those three, their hamper, my hamper, and the guitar case in the phaeton. And, of course, the phaeton was open, and I rode behind it, and Dora sat with her back to the horses, looking towards me. She kept the bouquet close to her on the cushion, and wouldn't allow Jip to sit on that side of her at all, for fear he should crush it. She often carried it in her hand, often refreshed herself with its fragrance. Our eyes at those times often met, and my great astonishment is that I didn't go over the head of my gallant grey into the carriage. There was dust, I believe. There was a good deal of dust, I believe. I have a faint impression that Mr. Spenlow remonstrated with me for riding in it, but I knew none. I was sensible of a mist of love and beauty about Dora, but of nothing else. He stood up sometimes and asked me what I thought of the prospect. I said it was delightful, and I dare say it was, but it was all Dora to me. The sun shone Dora, and the birds sang Dora. The south wind blew Dora, and the wild flowers in the hedges were all Dora's to a bud. My comfort is Miss Mills understood me. Miss Mills alone could enter into my feelings thoroughly. I don't know how long we were going, and to this hour I know as little where we went. Perhaps it was near Guildford. Perhaps some Arabian night magician opened up the whole place for a day, and shut it up for ever when we came away. It was a green spot on a hill, carpeted with soft turf. There were shady trees and heather, and as far as the eye could see, a rich landscape. It was a trying thing to find people there waiting for us, and my jealousy, even of the ladies, knew no bounds. But all of my own sex, especially one impostor, three or four years my elder, with a red whisker, on which he established an amount of presumption not to be endured, were my mortal foes. We all unpacked our baskets and employed ourselves in getting dinner ready. Red Whisker pretended he could make a salad, which I don't believe, and abjured himself on public notice. Some of the young ladies washed the lettuce for him and sliced them under his directions. Dora was among these, and I felt that fate had pitted me against this man, and one of us must fall. Red Whisker made his salad. I wonder how they could eat it. Nothing could have induced me to touch it and voted himself into the charge of the wine-cellar, which he constructed, being an ingenious beast, in the hollow of a tree-trunk. By and by I saw him, with the majority of a lobster on his plate, eating his dinner at the feet of Dora. I have but an indistinct idea of what happened for some time after this baleful object presented itself to my view. I was very merry, I know, but it was hollow merriment. I attached myself to a young creature in pink with little eyes, and flirted with her desperately. She received my attentions with favour, but whether on my account solely, or because she had any designs on red whisker, I can't say. Dora's health was drunk. When I drank it, I affected to interrupt my conversation for that purpose, and to resume it immediately afterwards. I caught Dora's eye as I bowed to her, and I thought it looked appealing. But it looked at me over the head of red whisker, and I was adamant. The young creature in pink had a mother in green, and I rather think the latter separated us from motives of policy. Howbeit, there was a general breaking up of the party, while the remnants of the dinner were being put away, and I strolled off by myself among the trees in a raging and remorseful state. I was debating whether I should pretend that I was not well and fly, I don't know where, upon my gallant grey, when Dora and Miss Mills met me. "'Mr. Copperfield,' said Miss Mills, "'you are dull.' I begged her pardon, not at all. And Dora, said Miss Mills, you are dull. Oh, dear, no, not in the least. Mr. Copperfield and Dora, said Miss Mills, with an almost venerable air, enough of this. Do not allow a trivial misunderstanding to wither the blossoms of spring, which, once put forth and blighted, cannot be renewed. I speak, said Miss Mills, from experience of the past, the remote, irrevocable past. The gushing fountains which sparkle in the sun must not be stopped in mere caprice. The oasis in the desert of Sahara must not be plucked up idly. 
I hardly knew what I did. I was burning all over to that extraordinary extent, but I took Dora's little hand and kissed it, and she let me. I kissed Miss Mills's hand, and we all seemed, to my thinking, to go straight up to the seventh heaven. We did not come down again. We stayed up there all evening. At first we strayed to and fro among the trees, I with Dora's shy arm drawn through mine, and heaven knows, folly as it all was, it would have been a happy fate to have been struck immortal with those foolish feelings, and have stayed among the trees for ever. But much too soon we heard the others laughing and talking and calling, Where's Dora? So we went back, and they wanted Dora to sing. Red Whisker would have got the guitar case out of the carriage, but Dora told him nobody knew where it was but I. So Red Whisker was done for in a moment, and I got it, and I unlocked it, and I took the guitar out, and I sat by her, and I held her handkerchief and gloves, and I drank in every note of her dear voice, and she sang to me, who loved her, and all the others might applaud as much as they liked, but they had nothing to do with it. I was intoxicated with joy. I was afraid it was too happy to be real, and that I should wake in Buckingham Street presently, and hear Mrs. Crupp clinking the teacups in getting breakfast ready. But Dora sang, and the others sang, and Miss Mills sang, about the slumbering echoes in the caverns of memory, as if she were a hundred years old, and the evening came on, and we had tea with a little kettle boiling gypsy fashion, and I was still as happy as ever. I was happier than ever when the party broke up, and the other people, defeated Red Whisker and all, went their several ways, and we went ours through the still evening and the dying light, with sweet scents rising up around us. Mr. Spenlow, being a little drowsy after the champagne, honour to the soil that grew the grape, to the grape that made the wine, to the sun that ripened it, and to the merchant who adulterated it, and being fast asleep in a corner of the carriage, I rode up by the side and talked to Dora. She admired my horse and patted him. Oh, what a dear little hand it looked upon a horse! And her shawl would not keep right, and now and then I drew it round her with my arm. And I even fancied that Jip began to see how it was, and to understand that he must make up his mind to be friends with me. That sagacious Miss Mills, too, that amiable, though quite use-up recluse, that little patriarch of something less than twenty, who had done with the world, and mustn't on any account have the slumbering echoes in the caverns of memory awakened, what a kind thing she did! "'Mr. Copperfield,' said Miss Mills, "'come to this side of the carriage a moment, if you can spare a moment. I want to speak to you.' "'Behold me, on my gallant grey, bending at the side of Miss Mills, with my hand on the carriage door.' Dora is coming to stay with me. She's coming home with me the day after to-morrow. If you would like to call, I am sure Papa would be happy to see you. What could I do but invoke a silent blessing on Miss Mills's head, and store Miss Mills's address in the securest corner of my memory? What could I do but tell Miss Mills, with grateful looks and fervent words, how much I appreciated her good offices, and what an inestimable value I set upon her friendship? Then Miss Mills benignantly dismissed me, saying, Go back to Dora. And I went, and Dora leaned out of the carriage to talk to me, and we talked all the rest of the way, and I rode my gallant grey so close to the wheel that I grazed his near foreleg against it, and took the bark off, as his owner told me, to the tune of three pounds seven, which I paid, and thought extremely cheap for so much joy. What time Miss Mills sat looking at the moon, murmuring verses, and recalling, I suppose, the ancient days when she and earth had anything in common. Norwood was many miles too near, and we reached it many hours too soon, but Mr. Spenlow came to himself a little short of it, and said, "'You must come in, Copperfield, and rest.' And I consenting, we had sandwiches and wine and water. In the light room, Dora, blushing, looked so lovely that I could not tear myself away, but sat there staring in a dream, until the snoring of Mr. Spenlow inspired me with sufficient consciousness to take my leave. So we parted, I riding all the way to London with the farewell touches of Dora's hand still light on mine, recalling every incident and word ten thousand times, lying down on my own bed at last, as enraptured a young noodle as ever was carried out of his five wits by love. When I awoke next morning I was resolute to declare my passion to Dora and know my fate. Happiness or misery was now the question. There was no other question that I knew of in the world, and only Dora could give the answer to it. I passed three days in a luxury of wretchedness, torturing myself by putting every conceivable variety of discouraging construction on all that ever had taken place between Dora and me. 
At last, arrayed for the purpose at a vast expense, I went to Miss Mills's, fraught with a declaration. How many times I went up and down the street, and round the square, painfully aware of being a much better answer to the old riddle than the original one, before I could persuade myself to go up the steps and knock, is no matter now. Even when, at last, I had knocked, and was waiting at the door, I had some flurried thought of asking if that were Mr. Blackboy's, in imitation of poor Barkis, begging pardon and retreating. But I kept my ground. Mr. Mills was not at home. I did not expect he would be. Nobody wanted him. Miss Mills was at home. Miss Mills would do. I was shown into a room upstairs where Miss Mills and Dora were. Jip was there. Miss Mills was copying music. I recollect it was a new song called Affection's Dirge. And Dora was painting flowers. What were my feelings when I recognised my own flowers, the identical Covent Garden market purchase? I cannot say that they were very like or that they particularly resembled any flowers that ever came under my observation. But I knew for the paper around them, which was accurately copied, what the composition was. Miss Mills was very glad to see me, and very sorry her papa was not at home, though I thought we all bore that with fortitude. Miss Mills was conversational for a few minutes, and then, laying down her pen upon affection's dirge, got up and left the room. I began to think I would put it off till to-morrow. "'I hope your poor horse was not tired when he got home that night,' said Dora, lifting up her beautiful eyes. "'It was a long way for him. I began to think I would do it to-day. "'It was a long way for him,' I said, for he had nothing to uphold him on the journey. "'Wasn't he fed, poor thing?' asked Dora. "'I began to think I would put it off till to-morrow.' "'Yes,' I said, "'he was well taken care of. I mean, he had not the unutterable happiness that I had in being so near you.' dora bent her head over her drawing and said after a little while i sat in the interval in a burning fever and with my legs in a very rigid state you didn't seem to be sensible of that happiness yourself at one time of the day i saw now that i was in for it and that it must be done on the spot you didn't care for that happiness in the least said dora slightly raising her eyebrow and shaking her head when you were sitting by miss kit kit i should observe was the name of the creature in pink with the little eyes "'Though certainly I don't know why you should,' said Dora, "'or why you should call it a happiness at all. "'But, of course, you don't mean what you say, "'and I am sure no one doubts your being at liberty to do whatever you like. "'Jip, you naughty boy, come here.' "'I don't know how I did it. "'I did it in a moment. "'I intercepted Jip. "'I had Dora in my arms. "'I was full of eloquence. "'I never stopped for a word. "'I told her how I loved her. "'I told her I should die without her. "'I told her that I idolised and worshipped her. Jip barked madly all the time. When Dora hung her head and cried and trembled, my eloquence increased so much the more. If she would like me to die for her, she had but to say the word, and I was ready. Life without Dora's love was not a thing to have on any terms. I couldn't bear it, and I wouldn't. I had loved her every minute, day and night, since I first saw her. I loved her at that minute to distraction. I would always love her every minute to distraction. Lovers had loved before, and lovers would love again, but no lover had ever loved, might, could, would, or should ever love as I loved Dora. The more I raved, the more Jip barked. Each of us, in his own way, got more mad every moment. Well, well, Dora and I were sitting on the sofa by and by, quiet enough, and Jip was lying in her lap, winking peacefully at me. It was off my mind. I was in a state of perfect rapture. Dora and I were engaged. I suppose we had some notion that this was to end in marriage. We must have had some, because Dora stipulated that we were never to be married without her papa's consent. But, in our youthful ecstasy, I don't think that we really looked before us or behind us, or had any aspiration beyond the ignorant present. We were to keep our secret from Mr. Spenlow, but I am sure the idea never entered my head then that there was anything dishonourable in that. Miss Mills was more than usually pensive when Dora, going to find her, brought her back, I apprehend because there was a tendency in what had passed to awaken the slumbering echoes in the caverns of memory. But she gave us her blessing, and the assurance of her lasting friendship, and spoke to us generally, as became a voice from the cloister. 
What an idle time it was, what an insubstantial, happy, foolish time it was, when I measured Dora's finger for a ring that was to be made of forget-me-nots, and when the jeweller, to whom I took the measure, found me out and laughed over his order-book, and charged me anything he liked for the pretty little toy, with its blue stones, so associated in my remembrance with Dora's hand, that yesterday, when I saw such another by chance on the finger of my own daughter, there was a momentary stirring in my heart like pain. When I walked about, exalted with my secret, and full of my own interest, and felt the dignity of loving Dora, and of being beloved, so much, that if I had walked on air I could not have been more above the people not so situated, who were creeping on the earth. When we had those meetings in the garden of the square, and sat within the dingy summer-house, so happy that I love the London sparrows to this hour for nothing else, and see the plumage of the tropics in their smoky feathers when we had our first great quarrel within a week of our betrothal, and when Dora sent me back the ring enclosed in a despairing cocked-hat note, wherein she used the terrible expression that our love had begun in folly and ended in madness, which dreadful words occasioned me to tear my hair and cry that all was over, when, under cover of the night, I flew to Miss Mills, whom I saw by stealth in the back kitchen where there was a mangle, and implored Miss Mills to interpose between us and avert insanity, when Miss Mills undertook the office and returned with Dora, exhorting us, from the pulpit of her own bitter youth, to mutual concession and the avoidance of the desert of Sahara. When we cried and made it up, and were so blessed again, that the back kitchen, mangle and all, changed to love's own temple where we arranged a plan of correspondence through Miss Mills always to comprehend at least one letter on each side every day. What an idle time! What an insubstantial, happy, foolish time! Of all the times of mind that time has in its grip, there is none that in one retrospect I can smile at half so much, and think of half so tenderly. <laughs>